the British Antarctic Survey. So going to Antarctica and measuring the depth of the ice and measuring yes. um, the melt rates and changes in the ice using radars that were custom built for that quite harsh environment. Uh, that's, yeah. Uh, uh, quite strict requirements. We have had uh, other projects looking at um, lava lakes within volcanoes, looking okay. at volcanic ash, looking at um, So for uh, those applications, uh, what kind of frequencies are, like, what kind of frequency radars are used for those applications? Okay, so for the ice penetration radars, you need a low frequency to send the signal yeah. all the way down two kilometers depth into the ice. So yeah. here we're talking about HF, um, tens tens of megahertz um, okay. kind of frequencies, or up to the hundreds of megahertz. Um, then for the volcanic radars, looking at the lava lake, that was more an X band to have a high enough frequency and a wide enough bandwidth to get fine uh, resolution of the movement of a lava lake that's moving with inside a volcano um, overall. Um, and then what other ones? There's some millimeter wave projects looking at the changes on a mountainside as a as a mountain expands when a volcano might be erupting. Um, <clears throat> so that's at quite high frequencies, um, overall maybe tens of gigahertz, um, in order to have the fine range resolution with the bandwidths that you can achieve at those those frequencies. Right, so again, yeah. a variety of frequencies. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, depends on application, basically. Absolutely. You look at yeah. your application, you look at your requirements, and then you start thinking about what's what's needed. Um, you know, size, weight, and power are also key requirements for practical systems that you deploy in the field. So, uh, yes, yes. Does it have? Yeah. So, like, uh, your group is also working on uh, hardware aspects of uh, these uh, systems yeah i think our group it, typically we end up building things so we okay. would build a radar build an antenna build an array build a system so there's a lot of systems that we construct um and then gather the data from them and analyze the data yeah 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 okay so we'll just wait for one two minutes more and then uh, we'll begin yeah, of course. yeah no problems yeah so the people that you've invited then, um, are this yeah. from your chapter, from your society, or your, your institute as well? <laughs> uh, yes. So basically, uh, participants are uh, from this institute also. And along with that, uh, uh, all over from India, I can say, because since it's a virtual, so we circulated the uh, event details among all yeah. interested participants. So yeah, so um, they'll be from all over the India. Okay, brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, one of the downsides, obviously, of COVID has been, has been many of those, but um, yes, maybe um, and a, a, a trying to think positively, um, yes. hybrid talks perhaps give access to people to attend seminars they wouldn't have seen before. Yeah. Uh, they don't have to travel across from one side of India to another just for a one-hour presentation. Yeah. Um, so maybe that's a benefit. Yeah, sure, sure. Even actually, we want to host you here if you'll be visiting <laughs> India. Yeah, well, wait, one time it would, would be nice to come across and visit India, absolutely. Yeah. I've never been myself, but I'd like to visit. Oh, yeah. Such a big country, quite diverse across its regions as well. Yeah, like terrain and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. From the north to the south. Must, must change quite a lot. <clears throat> <clears throat> well, and you mentioned a PhD. So, what is your PhD subject? Uh, so, it is basically uh, related to uh, using the electromagnetic response from the objects and the using of uh, resonance information uh, mm -hmm. of it uh, and extracting those features and uh, try to create one algorithm which will identify those objects, like specifically based on those resonance information. Okay. So I I tried to work on this dielectric coated objects initially uh, okay. to check the resonance and then a uh, few complex uh, targets like uh, scale model of aircrafts and yep. also uh, drones. Uh, yeah, things, yeah. Uh, they are consist of like composite materials. So 
uh, what is their um, residence information i can extract and then eventually apply the uh, algorithm such as uh, like there are various algorithms based on this uh, matrix pencil method okay and based on uh, frequency domain vector fitting and similar approaches interesting yeah is the, is it, is there a feedback loop in the way that you might sense the target and then adapt the waveform to to match to enhance these residencies yes yes that that can be done but uh, for now uh, it is kind of a one one way like only forward not a loop kind of thing okay. uh, it's like i'm just uh, creating an, a library of some fixed object and mm -hmm. then trying to uh, estimate or uh, um, trying to uh, predict that uh, this particular test object is from this uh, particular set of target of this library so okay. yeah but yeah is, whatever you mentioned like this things has been uh, is going on like people are trying to incorporate ml approach in this yeah and yeah, uh, yeah so and they are trying to uh, uh, i mean improve the accuracy of the algorithms mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so yes so yeah so i think we can start now Okay, yeah. I'll just go to my slides. Okay, I'm on my yeah. slides then. Yeah. Okay. So, good morning to you and good afternoon to all. So, myself, Prajakta uh, Sathe, I'm uh, volunteering as a uh, chair of this IEEE Student Branch Kharagpur section. So, today uh, we have an invited talk uh, from uh, Dr. Matthew Ritchie. He is from uh, Radar Sensing Group at uh, University College of London. So our today's uh, lecture topic is uh, Arrestor uh, Multifunction Radio Frequency Sensor. So I'll just briefly introduce our today's speaker and then we'll begin. So Dr. Matthew Ricci, he received uh, an MSc uh, degree in physics from the University of Nottingham in 2008. So following this, uh, he completed engineering degree at uh, UCL uh, in association with the Thales UK in 2013. Then he continued his uh, postdoctoral at the UCL, uh, where he worked on uh, machine learning applied to multistatic radar for microdoppler classification. So uh, he also took a uh, role of a senior uh, radar scientist position at the DSTL, that is different in Science Technology Laboratories uh, in 2017. And this was followed by a um, um, lecturership role at the UCL uh, in 2018. Since 2018, he is uh, associated with this radar sensing group. Uh, and also he serves as an a chair of IEEE AESS Society for uh, United Kingdom and Ireland. And he is a subject editor in chief for IET Electronic Letter Journal and a senior member of IEEE. Uh, also, he was awarded the 2017 IET RSN Best Paper Award as well as uh, Bob Hill Award at the 2015 IEEE uh, International Radar Conference. So, we are very uh, happy to host you here and we are very thankful that you accepted our re uh, request uh, for this invited talk. So I welcome all the audience, and then uh, now I'll hand over to uh, Dr. Ricci. So yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for that for that introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to speak to you today about a system that we've developed here at UCL, and we call it Arresto. Is the name for it, uh, and it sits under this umbrella of a multi-role RF sensor. <clears throat> So today I'll talk, I'll introduce myself, um, not spend too much time on that, um, then go on to talking about RF systems on a chip and this emergence of a highly integrated hardware technology that allows us to develop the systems and solutions that I'm talking about in the latter parts of the presentation. I'll go on to then uh, show the variety of modes and capabilities that we've developed based on an RF system on a chip, 
And this includes active radar, where you're in control of your waveform, you're sending a waveform and receiving it. Passive radar, where you're using signals that might be present already within the environment. Wideband digitization of the RF environment and the um, detection and classification of waveforms that are present. An example case of that, looking particularly at Internet of Things um, spectrum survey detection and classification by our real-time um, capability. Move on to the subject of joint radar and communications, which is the fusion of two technologies uh, or two applications that require the use of radio frequency spectrum, which is ever more congested and contested. So there's a growing trend of being able to fuse um, both jobs using the, the spectrum more efficiently. And we have a real example of that with our system. Then uh, describe the upgrades to an array-based solution where we'd like to use multiple channels with an antenna array and what that enables for us. And then conclude on what um, uh, I've discussed in the presentation today. Now, this variety of subjects could be a, a, a talk in, in their own right, so I am going to jump across quite a few different topics there, but feel free to ask me questions at the end about any particular one, and happy to delve in or provide further details. As you've said <clears throat> before, I completed my PhD at UCL, postdoc at UCL, looking at NetRAD, which was a multi-static radar, sea clutter, the reflections of radar signals off the sea, human microdoppler, looking at how people move, looking at drone classification or bird classification. I worked for the UK government, and then now I am an associate professor in the electronic engineering department at UCL, and my areas of interest include microdoppler, multi-statics, FPGA-based radar solutions, which is what the Arresta system is, and ES and radar fusion. Well, the group that I work within <clears throat> has a number of academics, um, Professor Hugh Griffiths, Professor Paul Brennan, Professor Kenneth Tong, and uh, Dr. Leibon Locke. And the, my team, though, within that is made up of three postdocs, Nal Peters, Colin Horn, and Marat Temiz. And I have six PhDs, three full-time, three part-time, across a variety of institutes, and looking to start two more PhDs in 2023. That should read, actually, now. We have a variety of visiting academics from um, who are leaders in their own field, and we enjoy collaborating with those. In terms of collaborations, <clears throat> as a group, we've worked with all of these different institutes here, um, which isn't an exhaustive list, but shows that we tend to like collaborating with other universities, um, international partners, or uh, other in institutes. The areas that our group covers is ever-evolving, but I would say broadly fit into these fields. We have passive radar projects, which look to use Wi-Fi or television signals to sense targets. We have multi-static radar where we have multiple nodes, multiple radars deployed, and we then sense and send and receive signals from different locations um, and then process those to, in order to increase our detection or classification probabilities or resilience to challenging scenarios. Multifunction RF sensors is the theme of today's talk, which is where one device is trying to perform multiple different roles that all utilize the RF spectrum. Microdoppler themed research, which looks at how targets move and how you can use that movement to classify their behaviors. Another part of the group looks at geoscience remote sensing, which covers Antarctic ice penetrating radar systems or volcano lava lake monitoring. Uh, or um, a volcano ash plume monitoring as well. We have some cognitive radar framework, which is the, the growing field of understanding how um, adaptive and cognitive sensing can be applied, where a sensor is able to learn, uh, have memory, and adapt to an environment and make decisions. And then there is uh, a part of the group that also looks at antenna design. This includes innovative concepts like liquid-based antennas or ferromagnetic antenna materials and how those could enhance and improve antenna capabilities for the future. So <clears throat> this talk focuses on a Xilinx RF system on a chip. 
This was released by Xilinx now a few years ago uh, and represents a highly integrated single <coughs> chip solution, um, which uh, is powerful, reconfigurable, and from my perspective, enables multiple different um, research topics to be uh, implemented. The chip itself is underneath this fan in the middle here. Uh, here we've got some RAM memory slots. Uh, here there's some input output connectors. And this is the connector board for the RF input and output to the, to the device. This is just a, a development board that you can purchase from Xilinx. Um, <clears throat> there is a, this is a first generation. There's been subsequent generations of this. And um, there's also industry um, partners that have integrated this into their own uh, solutions so you can purchase it from other companies that have um, got their own RF system on a chip solution now. In terms of the specs, uh, the system includes an ARM Neon processor cores, um, processing logic RAM, processing system uh, RAM, so RAM on different sides there, an FPGA, an ADC, and a DAC. <coughs> the, um, the attractiveness of this, of this device is that it has eight channels to transmit and eight channels to receive. It has gigasample per second uh, capabilities in both ADC and DAC, which are really quite significant, considering that is across all eight cha um, per channel as well. Uh, and it has a sizable FPGA logic uh, setup. The UCL system is based around this technology we've called Arresta. Um, phase one and phase two projects um, at the beginning of this produced a flexible multifunction modular RF solution, which can be used to create many different research themes um, across the areas of interest. The system is capable of operating as an active radar, a passive radar, or a spectrum survey sensor. Um, and it can, multi, multiple RF socks can be combined together now. So we're not using just one, but we can actually stack these together potentially as well. Many open research questions we're trying to address include um, when to use each of these modes. If you had a device that could be multi-mode, when should it be uh, each of these modes at what time? And can you fuse data from each of these modes? And can a cognitive radar concept be implemented in real time on such a system? On the bottom left here, I show how perhaps we could we we could deploy with one sensor here and another sensor spatially separated with GPS synchronized oscillators providing a coherent timing source and then sensing uh, a region in the middle there <coughs> as a bi-static solution. And on the right here, I've got a multi-frequency example where we're sensing at both five gigahertz and two point four gigahertz the exact same target simultaneously with a single device. So now we have multi band sensing capabilities. Systems capable of simultaneously measuring active and passive at the same time. This is unusual because typically you would see a sensor that's either an active radar and it's built to be an active radar and you design it with that <coughs> in mind, or you build something that is a passive radar and you build it to those requirements. It's unusual to observe a device that can operate in both modes particularly both modes simultaneously. Um, I, you know, I hesitate to say this is the only device to do that because it's, you know, it's difficult to claim those types of bold things, but it's certainly unusual and fairly unique in an open academic environment. It enables research into when it's best to be active and when it's best to be passive. You can imagine if you're an active radar, um, as soon as you transmit, um, that is det you're detectable because you're making a signal that could be uh, received by others. So if you're in a passive mode, you're not transmitting a signal. So you're reducing your detection probability of yourself. So there's a trade-off there because the active radar might provo provide better information on the uh, targets of interest, a higher SNR, um, better um, estimation accuracy of range and Doppler of a target. Uh, but that's traded off against the, the, the revealing your position by transmitting. And cognitive radar concepts can be explored into by introducing a perception action cycle into the hardware in real time. On the bottom here, it's a single target, which is a person walking. And you can see in the active radar mode on the left, the person's um, uh, diagonal line here showing their range increasing with time and some of their Doppler spectrum 
And then on the right here, at the same time or simultaneously, this is a person, the same person being measured, and this shows bistatic range cell versus Doppler, and that's their signature there. Um, so th this was a nice example of two modes being run in tandem. Why the RF SOC? Well, I've mentioned some benefits, but I think this is a step change in hardware capability, enabling the development of diverse number of applications. Using <clears throat> um, the off-the-shelf device plus upgrading its RAM, it could be cost-effective, even though it's not it's not cheap, but it's certainly perhaps cheaper than trying to develop a bespoke solution uh, from scratch. The focus of the development at the minute is in the fields of multi-static, adaptive, multi-role, passive radar, wide, wide band waveform design, and array-based processing. Some of the unique selling points of this system is what we tried to achieve is the ability to rack and stack multiple RF socks such that they are coherent and can drive a single array, or distribute them so that they become a multi-static solution that can sense targets in different positions all with a common hardware backend and common digital um, uh, solution um, that, that allows this modularity overall. <clears throat> um, so this idea of something that's scalable, modular, and distribute, and could be distributed is quite attractive, I believe. Some of the success of the project we worked on so far is we've created an FPGA coding framework that allows us to control the device. This is where the majority of the effort's gone into because it takes a lot of time in terms of complex coding um, of an FPGA to control it in the way that we want to. We've operated as an active passive radar, as I've shown. We've developed a multi-band uh, prototype front end that allows us to transmit S, 2.4, C, about 5 gigahertz, and X, uh, about 9.5 gigahertz. We have multi-polarized antennas to sense targets of different polarizations, which will give you further information on the target's behavior due to its polarimetric response. And a key achievement, I think, is the multi-board synchronization, where we can now connect multiple of these RF socks together and then feed a single array and have them coherent to each other. We've demonstrated wideband ES capture, and through a project called Petrus, we've looked at real-time Internet of Things signal classification. In terms of the active front end, here's a, a picture here of some custom design boards that we built um, from another project that we've used on this now that allow us access from zero to about 13 gigahertz um, of central tunable frequency with about 1.8 gigahertz of bandwidth uh, in, in any part within that. This allows us the access to 2.4, 5.8 and other and X-band regions that we can perform experiments within. The plan for an eight-band, eight channel adaption, and I'll come to that near the end of the talk, is um, in discussions and in development as well. So this would connect with our Xilinx digital backend in order to provide us this multi-band solution. And again, here's that example of two people walking and crossing each other being simultaneously measured by two different frequency bands. Some of the processing that we've applied, and this is shown in a publication at the International Radar Symposium in 2022, shows that the FMCW implementation and the passive radar implementation. This is how we're using the two different modes overall. The FMCW implementation has um, <clears throat> the ability to sample the received signal on two channels. Uh, and then as FMCW typically operates, is that the, the reference uh, channel, which is the exact um, chirps that are created, are mixed with the surveillance such that we only measure a difference or a beat frequency. An FMCW, which stands for Frequency Modulated Continuous Wave, um, the key advantage of that is the simplicity in terms of the ADC sampling rates after doing DRAMP mixing, so that you only measure the difference between those two signals. And the difference then, um, um, the relationship between the frequency of the beat frequency and its um, and range of target is proportional. So we can look at the Fourier spectrum of this DRAMP signal such that we can then detect targets at a given range. A key element of this processing chain, which is completed in the fabric, is decimation and redu data reduction. Now, the eight channels at 
many giga samples per second, if we ran the sensor with those at full rate on all eight channels, we wouldn't have sufficient throughput capabilities um, to push that data out of the, the hardware. So it really is a fire hose of data once you have these highly capable hardware solutions. Um, and you're facing a problem of what do I do with all of this? How do I reduce that data rate? So you need to implement things within the FPGA and at various stages of the process to reduce, reduce, reduce the data if possible. Um, here we can either store the data to our DDR RAM memory and then write to disk or do some uh, pre-processing Fourier transform and conversion to uh, DB scale and stream of Ethernet, a real-time range profile, um, waterfall plot type <coughs> result. So we can see real time in the field, some of the data. In terms of the passive radar implementation, it's a shorter processing chain here. We receive on two channels. One is a surveillance channel, one is a reference channel. Um, we uh, decimate slightly and we write to disk. And that's because we're doing the processing mostly offline with the passive radar processing at the minute, but we're currently implementing further real-time application processing into the, into the solution such that we can observe the passive radar results as well. In terms of what a passive radar might look like here, let's see, this is our illuminator of opportunity. And then we have our reference antenna, which is going to point straight at uh, this illuminator of opportunity. And then we have our surveillance channel here, um, which might be looking at the target, if this is the target, yeah? And the signal will also hit the target and reflect into this antenna. So now we have our two channels, which are these ADC channels um, being sampled and used for the passive radar. And then in terms of the active radar, we have, we use two transmit channels on the board one of which is merely cabled straight into a second channel and used as our reference to deramp and mix. And the second goes through an amplifier. An antenna hits the same target, is reflected back, filtered, and then digitized. And then these two digital channels, as shown in the previous slide, are mixed in digits such that we get a deramped signal afterwards. Here, we use a Wi-Fi router as our illuminator of opportunity, although we can use DVB-T. And if we use a Wi-Fi router, we want the um, Wi-Fi network to be active. And what we use is an MGen tool, which is an ability to stimulate the Wi-Fi network such that it's on a lot, and we have a good illuminator that's very active for us to do uh, passive radar with. <clears throat> so, uh, this shows uh, some of the signals um, I, that I think you've seen already before that I've talked about here. Uh, one thing that's worth noting is part of the work is uh, looked at using the Pi April code base, which is a uh, as a Git repository showing some passive radar processing. And the processing speed was increased using concepts from Graham Smith uh, from his publication called Extended Time Processing for Passive by Static Radar. Here's a video showing um, the passive radar detection of the target. You can see the targets moving out in bi-static range whilst maintaining a roughly constant Doppler frequency during the trial, um, just proving that we get the detection over the whole time. On the left is the active result, as I've already described, and that shows the whole movement over the whole time. <clears throat> This is various slices from that video, and we aligned these positions to the active radar's position estimate of the target. And we can see here the purple dots are showing where the bi-static radar detected the target. Once we map that onto a monostatic range um, for the same timestamps, and we can see a close agreement between where the active radar and the passive radar detect the target overall, okay? Um, and since the passive radar is detecting quite well and quite high SNR throughout, should we be using the active radar at this whole time? Or could we either reduce the power of the active radar or not use it at all and rely on the passive results? Um, and that's a data fusion problem and a decision-making problem that could be implemented there. 
Moving to a different mode totally, wideband ES, ES standing for electronic surveillance, is the, the challenge of trying to digitize as wide a bandwidth of RF as possible and detect all the signals you can within that broad bandwidth, okay? Now, we have about two gigahertz instantaneous bandwidth per channel. And if we interleave channels, we increase the bandwidth at the expense of the time resolution that we have managed to achieve. Adding an RF front end avoids frequency limitations of the RF SOC. And that RF front end was shown in previous pictures in, this, in these slides. We can switch channels and therefore central frequency instantaneously pretty much. Here on the right hand side, I'm showing six gigahertz of bandwidth from zero to six being digitized using three interleave channels of the RF SOC. And in this case, we've got a variety of signals that are present at different points in the frequency spectrum uh, that are turning on, turning off, have chirps or tones or different behaviors. And this could this is a just the tip of the iceberg of trying to represent a complex yeah, um, electromagnetic environment. And there's a current research trend, certainly, in trying to tackle this and being able to detect um, and understand all the signals that are present, particularly in really congested and contested environments where there's many, many signals. In terms of being multi-static, now I showed earlier, <clears throat> uh, maybe I won't go back to it, but I showed earlier uh, an example case where we had a GPS discipline oscillator clocking our radars. So here's one of the RF SOC nodes, here's another RF SOC node, and at each case we've got a clock <coughs> and that's providing an oscillator that's coherent. We need that because before radar, timing and coherence is everything. We need to be coherent to each other in order to be, um, be able to effectively detect the correct Doppler shifts and understand that where the range is from each sensor. So by having a GPS discipline oscillator, we can uh, provide a trigger input to start a capture, as well as a coherent local oscillator at each node. This is reliant on uh, the access to GPS as a signal, which is a, a, a signal that's very easily disrupted on the ground, um, and you can't necessarily rely on reliable access to GPS. So some of these GPS discipline oscillators do have uh, chip scale atomic clocks that allow free running um, upon loss of GPS and will maintain a level of performance throughout loss. On the right hand side here is just a custom board that we've used to interface from a commercial GPS DO to, between uh, our RF SOC and a commercially available device. Here I'm showing where we're using a monostatic sync node one monostatic node two or node zero node one and then a bistatic result and a bistatic result okay so now we have two radars and we have the bounce the monostatic bounce going out and back or the bistatic bounce going out and down and the same is true for the second node and that's why we have four results overall again this is just a person walking away and coming back to the radar sensor so now we have variety of geometries and modes that are being used to sense the target that's present and we are clearly coherent to each other at these various um at these two locations and there is no wired or sh wired shared clock between the radar nodes in terms of polarization <clears throat> Here we're just using a multipole antennas so we can measure HH, HV, VH, and VV. And this is some of the configurations we've used to achieve that, showing the various ADC channels and DAC channels we used. <laughs> the original fully polarized design and using four channels might result in something as much as 8.16 gigabits a second. But if we decimate, um, that can be uh, reduced significantly. Um, and also, if we interleave our transmit channels and only use two channels operating in parallel, there's a huge data reduction overall. And that's through the use of FMCW deramping as well. Here's an example case of those four polarization matrices being used to sense two crossing targets. So now we have the HH, the VV, and then the cross pole examples. Jumping to another project um, with the sensor, we used 
Internet of Things as a challenge for ourselves. So Internet of Things is, I'm sure most people on the call and on the uh, attending the presentation is aware of this subject, and it's where connected devices are, are being being used in a networked manner uh, that have some more small microcontrollers and ability to communicate with each other. Well, that ability to communicate comes with a variety of new protocols. So Internet of Things um, includes protocols like Bluetooth, Zigbee, um, and LoRa, as well as some others. So we focused on LoRa um, as a uh, waveform of interest in the defense area. Maybe that's for battlefield situational awareness of people using a LoRa protocol or if IEDs or, uh, are being triggered by such a protocol. And in the security um, circumstance, it might be awareness within your own IT infrastructure if um, devices are transmitting a LoRa signal and there really shouldn't be a LoRa device there um, and you have your wired uh, cybersecurity all nicely um, arranged and, and, and um, properly connected, but are you observing the spectra where wireless comms could be transmitting data out of your infrastructure and you're not aware of it? On the right-hand side there, this is what a LoRa protocol looks like. There's two up chirps and two and a half quarter down chirps um, that you can see um, happening uh, prior to a message payload being transmitted. These signals should be uh, quite, quite clear that they're chirped signals, a bit like FMCW chirps. So we're quite used to this type of structure. Um, and what we targeted is the detection of these down chirps here. So in this project, we set up a small PhiPi device, which represents a <coughs> uh, transmitter of LoRa protocols. And we used our device uh, to detect those signals over the air and try and detect when one is transmitted and extract its parameters so we can recognize what um, parameters were of the LoRa signal. We generated a database of signals for offline classification, as well as creating a real-time classification methodology. Here we had quite significant S SNRs. I mean, that's massive, 72, D 72 dBs, or um, um, a smaller SNR of just five de decibels, um, uh, as shown when, where, depending on the geometry we used. In terms of the algorithm, what we created was a channelized receiver that's using only 500 kilohertz channels across at 8 megahertz bandwidth, covering all the potential LoRa transmission ranges. We looked at spectrograms and we visualized the 8 megahertz spe spectrogram or spectrum uh, of LoRa showing that top channel. And on the bottom there, we looked at the multiple channels of the 500 kilohertz bandwidth. We implemented a power detector, looked at the spectrograms, and then created smaller, narrower 500 kilohertz spectrogram images. The LoRa protocol in Europe exists within 7 megahertz, bandwidth in the 868 megahertz regions, and the messages are coded either in 125 kilohertz or 250 kilohertz of bandwidth within that seven megs. Initial stages of the algorithm channelize the data into 500 kilohertz sections to reduce computational load overall, and this is how we try to observe where is their signals present. Once we have our channelized spectrogram, we can binary threshold the image, thin it so we're more accurately identifying where the lines are, and use something called a Huff transform, which allows you to identify straight lines within any image. And we're looking for these chirped straight lines. And this will tell us the angle that they're at and where they are present within the image and integrate that energy to a single point in the Huff space. A line detector is then applied after the Huff transform successfully isolates where the signal and energy is. And then a thin spectrum uh, image uh, is output overlaying lines where the detected LoRa signals are, as well as a LoRa parameter estimation part, which tells us what the um, spreading factor and other parameters are. The matching process takes place, which correlates the line candidates from the Huff transform with threshold crossing pixels in the image to, to isolate the extent of the lines identified. From these values, the parameters of the LoRa transmission can be characterized. So here's our two cases of high um, <coughs> dB SNR signals, and here's our or, or low SNR signals. Here's our data here being captured. And then part of the process then looks to identify these down chirps within the signal. Here's a couple of cases of 
a variety of different LoRa spreading factors, central frequencies, etc., showing the the system effectively detecting these in the offline processing. An example of what the system would look like is shown here in real real time, where we have the system here, an antenna, and the five pi transmitter. And this has been now published in the IEEE Access Journal, showing both the offline and the real-time classifier being um, successfully achieving this. Here in the screen, it's hard to see, but basically the command line here is reading out whenever it detects and classifies a LoRa protocol being transmitted. Um, I don't have a video of that, but you'll just have to trust me. Okay, moving to a second to last topic. This is radar and communication concepts. As I said earlier, radar and communication both use RF. The use of RF requires bandwidth, and it's already a congested, contested environment. Therefore, there's an attractive proposition of using the same bandwidth, same uh, space to coexist with, with radar and, and communication signals. This is either finding gaps and working alongside signals that are present, or using one waveform to do both jobs. Here, looking at dual functional base stations that can both detect a target and serve um, clients via communications is a growing area of research. What we applied here is index modulation, not something that we created, but something that was pro proposed previously. And we, but we've enabled a real-time experimental sensing and communication example case using our arrestor system. Parameters such as the central frequency, the polarization, the chirp rate were all changed on a chirp by chirp basis to encode data into what was an FMCW signal. In some cases, there's trade-offs between the communications and sensing, and future research will look to evaluate those trade-offs in real time. So um, here's that example case of communication and sensing happening. On the right here, we've got a set of different um, spectrums of different waveforms we sent, and you can see the center of those waveforms are shifting around. And here we've got a throughput versus SNR. So what's the predicted comms throughput that we can achieve? In two cases, we have <clears throat> uh, shown here, we can encode the payload onto an FMCW radar signal, indices with central frequency bandwidth and polarization. And we've got um, transmitting with our arrestor platform through two channels with V-pole and H-pole. And we modulate our central frequency and bandwidth on each of these. And then we've got a receiver, a communications receiver, which has two channels receive, V and H-pole. Uh, and then this tries to use a maximum likelihood estimator to estimate the central frequency, polarization, and bandwidth, and then convert that into our symbol um, of our comms data. This was published um, as a joint paper between myself, Niall, Colin, Christos, um, and Christos Mazuris, led by Marat Timis. Here you can see how the size of the bandwidth steps affects the data throughput. Obviously, if we move the central frequency only little steps, we've got many options of where we can place it, and therefore more number of bits of communication. Here we're talking between nine and five bits, depending on if we have a quarter megahertz step size or a five megahertz step size. But if we step only smaller step sizes, then the communication receiver needs to be more accurate when it's estimating the central frequency. Pardon me. So there's a trade-off here. Um, here you can see how we can achieve higher sample rates at higher signal to noise ratios for the communications receiver and simulated and experimental data seems to agree fairly well. <coughs> we now are adapting the RF system on a chip board uh, to allow us access to all eight channels at frequency ranges that we are interested in in a modular uh, and scalable way. This card on the right-hand side here that's provided by Xilinx directly is being replaced by our own custom daughter board, as well as modular drop-in cards, which are receive channel or transmit channels. These will allow us to have <coughs> a modular access to different frequency bands uh, and feed into an antenna array 
all the previous results I talked about so far only use either one or two channels, and they aren't configured in an array um, manner. By building an array antenna, we allow ourselves access to beam steering and uh, array-based processing. Um, this is uh, a big area of research, and lots of radar systems are moving from mechanically scanned to electrically scanned, uh, and having the ability to do beam forming and uh, steering your energy and receiving signals from a given direction without mechanically moving your antenna. A early prototype of this is shown here, and we've since upgraded this. Uh, this is a 16 channel with two parasitic elements, um, C band array. And what we can do is feed two RF socks to this device such that we can fully populate all the elements. And this antenna is not just an antenna, but there is a, a, an RF converter board at the back of it, which is mixing down to an IF frequency, which the arrestor platform can digitize. We're interested in beamforming because, or an array, because it allows beamforming, tracking of targets in range and azimuth, where previously all the results I was showing were only a staring array a antenna that had range only, or range and Doppler as the two dimensions. Now we will have range and azimuth by doing beamforming with our array. We can do direction of arrival estimation of signals of interest within the viewing angle of the array, and we can form nulls within the um, with our beamforming. Uh, algorithms such that we can reduce interference at any given angle that it might be present within. And these are all research themes we're interested in exploring further. Possible degrees of freedom for a cognitive radar as well as this attribute would be parameter optimization, looking at your pulse repetition frequency or your power, waveform optimization on a pulse to pulse uh, waveform transmit <laughs> implemented on a, the communications radar waveform element. Uh, that I've just talked about, and how these things can maybe be adaptive, uh, maybe prioritizing communications at one point or prioritizing um, radar at another point, the active passive mode selection, as I've mentioned, and multi-static sensing networks for sensor fusion using intelligent sensor design. Some of the concepts could be a passive radar providing us a low probability of intercept, um, use of the RF energy transmitted by third parties and the use of frequency bands, which might otherwise be unavailable, which is why that's that's a benefit uh, for a passive radar. But the illuminator of opportunity may not provide the radar resolution required, and the target might um, of interest might become obscured by the transmission. So a cognitive radar could then use these pros and cons to make some decisions based on whether it should be active or passive, and our sensor platform has that capability. Okay, I've kind of wandered through quite a wide range of subjects there and apologize if it kind of hopped around a bit. Um, I'm happy to speak further on any one of those subjects. But in summary, we have a proof of concept of a sensing solution based on an RF SOC. It addresses the low swap C hardware architecture, swap C being size, weight, and power commercially off the, off the shelf, uh, whilst also being an enabler for almost every key research trend within radar. We have proven operation in active radar modes, passive radar modes, and ES receiver modes, as well as joint radar communication, as I've discussed. We're able to operate in some of these modes simultaneously. The flexible FPGA framework we've developed allows rapid changing between these modes. And we've shown lots of initial capabilities in each of these areas, but there's also headroom for future research outputs in all of those modes. Areas of interest we'd like to move towards is a scalable multi-static system growing that further, the modular array platform I've talked about, the multi-band operation opportunities, uh, polarization or multi-static operation, <clears throat> stacking multiple of these RF socks into a wideband RF array, GPS denied operation, cognitive radar technology demonstrator, joint active and passive um, detecting and track level fusion, and ES capture and signal identification. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Richie. So it seems we have a few questions. So yep. I request the uh, audience uh, or participants to kindly unmute yourself and you can ask the question. So Pankaj Chawla, can you hear me?
Yeah, so he is asking which signal is deployed for chirping. Let's have a look here. So what was the question, sorry? Which yeah. signals deploy for chirping? Okay, so we use an FMCW signal to um, <clears throat> create our chirped waveform. So this is a, um, if you have a, a plot like this, it looks like this. Okay, and if this is frequency and this is time, this is our chirped waveform, okay? Um, so we would then receive our de time delayed response. It's gonna be quite hard to draw this with my mouse, which is gonna be a time delayed received signal, like this. And therefore the distance between here tells us how far the target was away. But that distance in time, T, is proportional to the difference in frequency, the vertical difference separation between the curves. So that's why if we mix these two, the transmitted and received signal, we will be able to detect how far the target is away by what was the frequency of that difference, the beat frequency, beat if you will. Frequency. Yeah. So yeah. we use an FMCW mode to, to, to detect that, and that's our chirped waveforms. I don't know if there was any further attributes to that question. Um, yeah. Which signal do you deploy? Yeah, so it's an FMCW signal. Yes. So next question is from Niranjan Kumar. So he is asking how synthetic aperture radar adds to instantaneous capture image and improve the quality of an image. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. So uh, at the minute, we, we don't work as a synthetic aperture radar, <clears throat> but we might do in the future. Um, so synthetic aperture radar, the word synthetic means... Um, a virtual or not not necessarily a real aperture, okay? So in that way, for a synthetic aperture radar to operate, you need to move your antenna physically, normally in a straight line, and you create a virtual antenna in space, in an area, okay? And that virtual antenna, if you, if you fly 500 meters in a straight line, you now can imagine a floating 500 meter long antenna in the sky which is brilliant because you won't be able to fit a 500 meter antenna onto a plane, okay? So um, by making a really large virtual antenna in space, you'll get the benefit of fine azimuth resolution <laughs> if you can connect all of the data that you gather um, with, that, with that process. So um, for synthetic aperture radar, you need to move your antenna and then connect all, the, uh, fuse all of the data together to use a back projection algorithm or something like this, such that you produce radar imagery. And SAR is a brilliant area of radar because you produce all this amazing imagery and it's really uh, quite fascinating to look at. The question there says, how can SAR add to instantaneous capture image and improve the quality of the image? Um, so I'm, I'm not quite sure um, what you meant by adding the images and improving the quality of the images. There's a lot of complex processing behind synthetic aperture radar such that you can Im Im improve the focus, uh, uh, the, the, the resolution, um, the contrast across all of the images that you're, uh, you're processing there. Um, you can coherently add SAR images together to try and increase the um, overall SNR of the, the image. It all depends on the geometry that they're taken at, though, and whether they're registered to each other and they're aligned overall. Um, but we, we, we aren't doing SAR at the minute. Um, um, but uh, are, are certainly interested in it for the future. Yes, uh, so thank you, sir. So, okay, so for now, uh, yeah, so I wanted to add, ask one more question. Uh, so sure. you mentioned about the uh, use of an active and passive uh, radar uh, mm -hmm. simultaneously. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to know, like, uh, how the data is collected uh, by using that uh, structure, and uh, what is the system level? I mean, uh, operations which are happening. Okay, so for an active radar, we use the waveforms I talked about. We make a FMCW chirp. We send it and we receive it. We then mix the transmitted and received signal and we get the beat frequency, and we Fourier transform the beat frequency, so we now have a range profile, which is a range to a target. It, for one chirp, we produce one range profile, but we don't just send one chirp, we send thousands and thousands of them. So we then have many range profiles, 
and we stack them together till we make a matrix which is range versus time and then that's all the images that you saw which have um, people walking for example let's go back to one of these example okay here we go oh that's not that clear here we go so you can see a person walking here which <clears throat> their range versus time is this triangle as you see them walking out and coming back again yeah so that's how the fmcw active radar mode that's going away from the radar this is coming towards yes in terms of the passive radar processing what's needed there is you have also have at least two channels one is the surveillance channel and one is the reference channel the objective there is your reference channel you would typically point that towards the illuminator of opportunity, the transmitter, okay? That might be a television tower that's transmitting all these television signals, okay? Um, and then your surveillance channel, you'll point towards your target, okay? Typically, you wouldn't want the target between you and the transmitter because it would be like looking towards the sun and trying to see a target. You'd be blinded by the strong signal okay so you want the target placed at an angle away from there um such that you can uh, not look directly at the really strong illuminator with these two channels of data you then um use the um passive radar processing steps which involve a lot of correlations both uh, time delay correlations and um uh, doppler shift correlations okay so if we do different time delays, we look at by shifting the reference and surveillance channel against each other until we find a peak, which would represent a time delayed version being received. And that's because the signal bounced off the target and came down to us compared to the straight line one. Yeah, and then so we can do the same by doing Doppler shifts and finding where a Doppler shift of the target is. Yeah, so but in case of a passive uh, mode, uh, there might be an illuminator, strong illuminator. Suppose inside the house, uh, we are uh, doing yeah, you can use Wi-Fi or something like that, yeah. Yeah, so there might be various illuminators because of a Wi-Fi hotspot or modem or mobile phone or maybe some other places. So, like, how the reference point is uh, decided? I mean, oh, that's a good. That's a good question. So, um, in reality, if we're doing experiments, we typically know where the illuminator yeah, is. So we yeah. point our and are at it. As you say, maybe there's many illuminators and you aren't aware of where they are. So perhaps you need to initially do a, a scan yeah, to find yeah. where the illuminators are and then put your reference towards the strongest signal there and then arrange your surveillance channel to point towards other areas to detect targets. Yeah. If you had a, an array, perhaps you could do this real time and you can yes. form beams towards the strongest as well as the other directions and do simultaneous processing steps. Yes, yeah, so but beam, you're beam absolutely forming. right that this would be a challenge. Yes, yes. So beam forming might be a uh, like helping be a in this. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So we have a few questions here. So V Madhavan, he is asking, can we use it uh, for surveillance and target together? Uh, yeah, I think yeah. that came up when I was talking about passive radar. Yes. Um, so you, you have two channels of data and you need to compare them in order to detect the target. So you need your reference and your surveillance channels and you compare them to detect a target which is delayed and Doppler yes. shifted. Yes. So in this case, we'll have range information also. Yeah, you, from, you. you can get range and Doppler information in your passive radar by doing that. Yeah. Okay, so... Uh, next question is from Chandan Mishra. So he's asking, what was the clock frequency of uh, GPSDO used? And what was the maximum channel bandwidth you able to processing in hardware? And what was the resolution of the ADC used? Sure. So the, the GPSDOs, which are um, off-the-shelf devices, we've got one which is a Trimble-based device, and we've got one which is made by SpectraTime. They typically output what is a 10 megahertz signal, which is their clock signal that we can use. And they operate and they output something called a P one PPS, or, which is one pulse per second. So we are using the 10 megahertz signal. We actually have an adapter that shifts that, that makes five megahertz based on that, because we can feed that to the uh, arrester clock. 
input and synchronize all the eight channels with a five megahertz input. And there's a publication next month talking about how we achieve that. Um, what is the maximum channel bandwidth you're able to process? Okay, so here, <clears throat> um, I, the widest bandwidth that we digitized was that six gigahertz example case where we interleaved three channels together, two gigahertz per channel. Uh, to get six gigahertz of data. Now, because of input output challenges, that's gonna be really difficult to maintain in terms of having constantly rec recording that amount of data. I have a small talk about the input output challenges that's on the UCL Radar Group YouTube channel. Um, so you can have a look at that. Niall Peters created the slides and gave um, the talk previously, and then I presented it and recorded it. So you can look there for some further comments on that. And then the resolution of the ADCs. So the ADCs, I think they were mentioned really early on in the talk. Let's have a look here. Um, it's, here we go. So there's a 14-bit BAC and a 12-bit ADC. Um, that, those are the resolutions um, of those. I think that might be in, increased or improved in later generations of the RF system on a chip but we, we are using the generation one at the minute um, overall. Yes, so thank you. Uh, so I think it answers his question. So now there is one more question uh, by Evigny Markin. So he's asking what wavelength of a transmitter or receiver was used in the experiment and what was the distance between the antennas in the bi-static version of the radar? Okay, yeah, thank you for your question. So. <clears throat> We used a variety of different central frequencies. We tend to use ISM bands because that means we don't need to acquire a license to transmit. Um, we can use Wi-Fi either at 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz. And if we stay below a certain power level, um, we don't need to uh, acquire RF licenses for transmission. <clears throat> uh, but we have the capability from that RF front end to operate between 0 and 13 gigahertz but that was, is at the minute only a single channel RF front end, not a multi-channel. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of the results that I showed in the presentation were from either 2.4 gigahertz or 5.8 gigahertz um, overall. In the bi-static case, we've only done this in short range baselines, um, 50 meters, 100 meters. Um, although in other deployments, when we used higher power amplifiers through collaborations with South Africa, we've deployed bi-static baselines of two kilometers separation um, and two and a half kilometers in, uh, in other cases um, so it, it, it's merely what geometries we want to deploy and maintain line of sight between nodes but for our arrestor experiments so far we've typically used smaller um, uh, baseline separations just for logistics and we're using a low power amplifier so if we separate too far then um, the, the link budget won't be very good to detect targets overall but um, yeah, I look forward to trying to expand the bi-static baselines and do further, more elaborate uh, deployments in the future. Yeah, so yeah, thank you, sir. So I hope this answers his question. So thanks a lot, uh, like all the audience for such an uh, interactive session and coming with the questions. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Matt, uh, for your time and uh, to agree to conduct, uh, I mean, come for this invited talk. No uh, thanks a lot. Yeah. So I think we can conclude now uh, if anyone don't have any questions. And uh, so is it possible to, um, yeah, so is it possible to have a uh, PPT slides, uh, I mean, to share with the audience participants? Yeah, I'll see if I can get uh, a PDF of those. <clears throat> yeah. Yes, sir. sure, sir. So thank you. We hope to see you at uh, IIT Kharagpur. Uh, maybe yeah, thank you very much in for the hosting. Yes, yeah, sir. yeah. Maybe one day I'll, I'll be able to come visit. And thank you very much for listening to my talk. If you'd like to follow up, welcome to drop me an email. Yeah. Uh, and we do have other presentations from our group that are available online. If you look up the UCL Radar Group, you'll be able to see some other talks that we give. But yeah, yes. thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye now. Yeah. Thank you all.